The Plot to Kill Jesus When Jesus had finished saying all these things, he told his disciples, You know that the Passover takes place after two days, and the Son of Man will be handed over to be crucified. Then the chief priests and the elders of the people assembled in the courtyard of the high priest, who was named Caiaphas, and they conspired to arrest Jesus in a treacherous way and kill him. Not during the festival, they said, so there won't be rioting among the people. The Anointing at Bethany While Jesus was in Bethany at the house of Simon the leper, a woman approached him with an alabaster jar of very expensive perfume. She poured it on his head as he was reclining at the table. When the disciples saw it, they were indignant. Why this waste, they asked. This might have been sold for a great deal and given to the poor. Aware of this, Jesus said to them, Why are you bothering this woman? She has done a noble thing for me. You always have the poor with you, but you do not always have me. By pouring this perfume on my body, she has prepared me for burial. Truly I tell you, wherever this gospel is proclaimed in the whole world, what she has done will also be told in memory of her. Then one of the twelve, the man called Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priests and said, What are you willing to give me if I hand him over to you? So they weighed out thirty pieces of silver for him, and from that time he started looking for a good opportunity to betray him. Betrayal at the Passover on the first day of unleavened bread, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, Where do you want us to make preparations for you to eat the Passover? Go into the city to a certain man, he said, and tell him, The teacher says, My time is near. I am celebrating the Passover at your place with my disciples. So the disciples did as Jesus had directed them and prepared the Passover. When evening came, he was reclining at the table with the twelve. While they were eating, he said, Truly I tell you, one of you will betray me. Deeply distressed, each one began to say to him, Surely not I, Lord. He replied, The one who dipped his hand with me in the bowl, he will betray me. The Son of Man will go just as it is written about him, but woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been better for him if he had not been born. Judas, his betrayer, replied, Surely not I, Rabbi. You have said it, he told him. The First Lord's Supper As they were eating, Jesus took bread, blessed it, and broke it, gave it to the disciples, and said, Take and eat it. This is my body. Then he took a cup, and after giving thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink from it, all of you. For this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. But I tell you, I will not drink from this fruit of the vine from now on, until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. After singing a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. Peter's denial predicted. Then Jesus said to them, Tonight all of you will fall away because of me. For it is written, I will strike the shepherd, and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. But after I have risen, I will go ahead of you to Galilee. Peter told him, Even if everyone falls away because of you, I will never fall away. Truly I tell you, Jesus said to him, Tonight, before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. Even if I have to die with you, Peter told him, I will never deny you. And all the disciples said the same thing. The prayer in the garden. Then Jesus came with them to a place called Gethsemane. And he told the disciples, sit here a while while, while I go over there and pray. Taking along Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, he began to be sorrowful and troubled. And he said to them, I am deeply grieved to the point of death. Remain here and stay awake with me. Going a little farther, he fell face down and prayed, my father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Yet, not as I will, but as you will. Then he came to the disciples and found them sleeping. And he asked Peter, so couldn't you stay awake with me one hour? Stay awake and pray so that you won't enter into temptation. The spirit is willing, but 
but the flesh is weak. Again, a second time, he went away and prayed, My Father, if this cannot pass unless I drink it, your will be done. And he came again and found them sleeping because they could not keep their eyes open. After leaving them, he went away again and prayed a third time, saying the same thing once more. Then he came to the disciples and said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? See, the time is near. The Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Get up, let's go. See, my betrayer is near. Judas's Betrayal of Jesus While he was still speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, suddenly arrived. A large mob with swords and clubs was with him from the chief priests and the elders of the people. His betrayer had given them a sign, the one I kiss, he's the one, arrest him. So immediately he went up to Jesus and said, greetings rabbi, and kissed him. Friend, Jesus asked him, why have you come? Then they came up, took hold of Jesus and arrested him. At that moment, one of those with Jesus reached out his hand and drew his sword. He struck the high priest's servant and cut off his ear. Then Jesus told him, put your sword back in its place because all who take up the sword will perish by the sword. Or do you think that I cannot call on my father and he will provide me here and now with more than 12 legions of angels? How then would the scriptures be fulfilled that say it must happen that way? At that time, Jesus said to the crowds, have you come out with swords and clubs as if I were a criminal to capture me? Every day I used to sit teaching in the temple and you didn't arrest me. But at this has happened so that the writings of prophets would be fulfilled. Then all the disciples deserted him and ran away. Jesus faces the Sanhedrin. Those who had arrested Jesus led him away to Caiaphas, the high priest, where the scribes and the elders had convened. Peter was following him at a distance, right to the high priest's courtyard. He went in and was sitting with the servants to see the outcome. The chief priests and the, and the whole Sanhedrin were looking for false testimony against Jesus so that they could put him to death. But they could not find any, even though many false witnesses came forward. Finally, two came forward, stating, This man said, I can destroy the temple of God and rebuild it in three days. The high priest stood up and said to him, Don't you have an answer for what these men are testifying against you? But Jesus kept silent. The high priest said to him, I charge you under oath by the living God, tell us if you are the Messiah, the Son of God. He said it, Jesus, you have said it, Jesus told him. But I tell you, in the future, you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming on the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest tore his robes and said, He has blasphemed. Why do you still need witnesses? See, now you've heard the blasphemy. What is your decision? They answered, He deserves death. Then they spat in his face and beat him. Others slapped him and said, Prophesy to us, Messiah. Who was it that hit you? Peter denies his Lord. Now Peter was sitting outside in the courtyard. A servant girl approached him and said, You were with Jesus the Galilean too. But he denied it in front of everyone. I don't know what you're talking about. When he had gone out to the gateway, another woman saw him and told those who were there, this man was with Jesus the Nazarene. And again, he denied it with an oath, I don't know the man. After a little while, those standing there approached and said to Peter, you really are one of them, since even your accent gives you away. Then he started to curse and swear with an oath, I don't know the man. Immediately, a rooster crowed, and Peter remembered the words Jesus had spoken. Before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. And he went outside and wept bitterly. Jesus handed over to Pilate. When daybreak came, all the chief priests and the elders of the people plotted against Jesus to put him to death. After tying him up, they led him away and handed him over to Pilate the governor. Judas hangs himself. Then Judas, his betrayer, seeing that Jesus had been condemned, was full of remorse and returned the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and elders. 
I have sinned by betraying innocent blood, he said. What's that to us, they said. See to it yourself. So he threw the silver into the temple and departed. Then he went and hanged himself. The chief priests took the silver and said, It's not permitted to put it into the temple treasury since it is blood money. They conferred together and bought the potter's field with it as a burial place for foreigners. Therefore, that field has been called blood field to this day. Then what was spoken through the prophet Jeremiah was fulfilled. They took the 30 pieces of silver, the price of him whose price was set by the Israelites, and they gave them for the potter's field as the Lord directed me. Jesus faces the governor. Now Jesus stood before the governor. Are you the king of the Jews? The governor asked him. Jesus answered, you say so. While he was being accused by the chief priests and elders, he didn't answer. Then Pilate said to him, don't you hear how much they are testifying against you? But he didn't answer him on even one charge so that the governor was quite amazed. Jesus or Barabbas. At the festival, the governor's custom was to release to the crowd a prisoner they wanted. At that time, they had a notorious prisoner called Barabbas. So when they had gathered together, Pilate said to them, Who is it you want me to release for you, Barabbas or Jesus who is called Christ? For he knew it was because of envy that they had handed him over. While he was sitting on the judge's bench, his wife sent word to him, Have nothing to do with that righteous man. For today I have suffered terribly in a dream because of him. The chief priests and elders, however, persuaded the crowds to ask for Barabbas and to execute Jesus. The governor asked them, Which of the two do you want me to release for you? Barabbas, they answered. Pilate asked them, What should I do then with Jesus, who is called Christ? They answered, Crucify him. Then he said, Why? What has he done wrong? but they kept shouting all the more, crucify him. When Pilate saw that he was getting nowhere, but that a riot was starting instead, he took some water, washed his hands in front of the crowd and said, I am innocent of this man's blood. See to it yourselves. All the people answered, his blood be on us and on our children. Then he released Barabbas to them. And after having Jesus flogged, handed him over to be crucified mocked by the military. Then the governor's soldiers took Jesus into the governor's residence and gathered the whole company around him. They stripped him and dressed him in a scarlet robe. They twisted together a crown of thorns and put it on his head and placed a staff in his right hand. And they knelt down before him and mocked him, Hail, King of the Jews! Then they spat on him, took the staff, and kept hitting him on the head. After they had mocked him, they stripped him of the robe, put his clothes on him, and led him away to crucify him, crucified between two criminals. As they were going out, they found a Cyrenian man named Simon. They forced him to carry the, his cross. When they came to a place called Golgotha, which means place of the skull, they gave him wine mixed with gall to drink. But when he tasted it, he refused to drink it. After crucifying him, they divided his clothes by casting lots. Then they sat down and were guarding him there. Above his head, they put up the charge against him in writing, this is Jesus, King of the Jews. Then the two criminals were crucified with him, one on the right, one on the left. Those who passed by were yelling insults at him, shaking their heads and saying, You who would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself. If you are the Son of God, come down from the cross. At the same time, the chief priests with their scribes and elders mocked him and said, He saved others, but he cannot save himself. He's the King of Israel. Let him come down now from the cross and we will believe in him. He trusts in God, let God rescue him now. If he takes pleasure in him, for he said, I am the son of God. In the same way, even the criminals who were crucified with him taunted him. The death of Jesus. From noon until three in the afternoon, darkness came over the whole land. 
About three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. That is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of those standing there heard this, they said, he's calling for Elijah. Immediately one of them ran and got a sponge, filled it with sour wine, put it on a stick, and immediately offered him a drink. But the rest said, let's see if Elijah comes to save him. But Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and gave up his spirit. Suddenly the curtain of the sanctuary was torn from top to bottom. The earth quaked and the rocks were split. The tombs were also opened and the many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And they came out of their tombs after his resurrection, entered into the holy city and appeared to many. When the centurion and those with him who were keeping watch over Jesus saw the earthquake and these things that had happened, they were terrified and said, truly, truly, this man was the son of God. Many women who had followed Jesus from Galilee and looked after him were there, watching from a distance. Among them was Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Joseph, and the mother of Zebedee's sons. The Burial of Jesus When it was evening, a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph came, who he himself had become a disciple of Jesus. He approached Pilate and asked for Jesus' body. Then Pilate ordered that it be released. So Joseph took the body, wrapped it in clean, fine linen, and placed it in his new tomb, which he had cut into the rock. He left after rolling a great stone against the entrance of the tomb. Mary Magdalene and the other Mary were seated there facing the tomb. The closely guarded tomb. The next day, which followed the preparation day, the chief priests and Pharisees gathered before Pilate and said, Sir, we remember that while this deceiver was alive, he said, After three days I will rise again. So give the orders that the tomb be made secure until the third day. Otherwise, his disciples may come, steal him, and tell people, He has been raised from the dead, and the last deception will be worse than the first. You have a guard of soldiers, Pilate told them. Go and make it as secure as you know how. They went and secured the tomb by setting a seal on the stone and placing the guard. No 
gifts, no power, no wisdom. But I who boast in Jesus Christ, His death and resurrection. Why should it came from His reward? I can't. One of the most powerful parts of Jesus' passion story to me, when we read the story of his betrayal and his arrest and his trial and ultimately his crucifixion, has always been the scene in the garden. And Matthew doesn't give us a lot of detail, but John does. And in John chapter 17, we read about what Jesus went through as he was preparing for the cross. And the picture that John paints for us is powerful. And what we see in that story is that before Jesus ever suffered physically on the cross, Jesus suffered in different ways in the garden. When we find Jesus in the garden, he's suffering emotionally and mentally. He's overwhelmed and even to the point of being crushed by despair and anxiousness and depression as the cross is looming for him and the hour of his trial comes near. And what I think is so powerful about this is in the midst of all that, Jesus is suffering immensely. Before his blood was poured on the cross, his tears are being poured out here in the garden. And in the midst of all that, what we find is a Jesus who's on his knees praying. And while he prays first that if God would allow it, that this cup would pass, he says, God, if there's any other way, please do it. But after that, he goes on to pray for us. That's shocking to me. With everything that Jesus was thinking about, his attention and his concern was turned to those who would follow after him. And I've heard it said before that the cross shows us what the shape of God's love looks like. But I think we actually see in the garden another picture of what God's love looks like. And that picture looks like a weeping Savior who's weeping tears of love for us. That's incredible. On Good Friday, we remember that if there's one word that could describe God's attitude toward us, towards you, it's love. And that love was displayed powerfully in a Savior who was on his knees weeping for you before you ever had a thought of him, before ultimately sacrificing himself selflessly to be beaten and killed on a cross. My friends, as we celebrate, and that seems like a strange word sometimes, to celebrate someone's death, what we celebrate is the triumphant, merciful love of God. I heard someone say uh, that in this scene, what we see is that we have a faithful friend in the Garden of Gethsemane. When we go through times of depression, anxiousness, despair, fear, who can walk alongside us and understand better than our faithful friend who we find wrestling with those same things in Gethsemane? Today, as we navigate the challenges of our world and the anxiousness and the frustrations and the challenges that we face in this day, we're better to go with all of those feelings than to Jesus, our loving Savior. 
this Good Friday, I'd invite you to trust Him, to seek Him, and to experience that love for yourself. We're going to take some time right now to close our service by taking communion. And so what I would ask you to do is right where you're at in your home to get the emblems ready. Many of you are probably preparing for dinner even right now as we speak. And we're going to let you close the service on your own wherever you're at by taking the emblems. And then we'd encourage you to pray together or by yourself wherever you're at. So I'm going to pray and that's going to be how we close tonight. And we'll hope that on this Good Friday that you would remember that we have a loving and faithful friend who walks with us in Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father, thank you that as we remember and celebrate Good Friday, that we remember and celebrate your love. That true love doesn't look like flowers and chocolates. It looks like a Savior who gave himself up for the sins of the world and a Savior who wept for us and suffered in the Garden of Gethsemane. Thank you that in any suffering we face in this life, we have a faithful Savior and friend in Jesus. God, today we come together to remember that sacrifice and to give glory to you. So as we prepare to take communion right now, God, and we take the bread and we drink the cup, we remember that it's the sacrifice of Jesus that shows us true love and makes forgiveness of our sins possible. Thank you that as your word says, he took upon himself the punishment of our iniquities, that it was laid on him. And so that God, we can be forgiven and redeemed because of his sacrifice. We worship you now and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.